Today, we are delighted to have Debbie Diller, author of Simply Small Groups and a series of Simply Stations books, who will be talking about the why, what, and how of small group literacy instruction. And for a nice surprise to start your week, Corwin will be giving away two books at the end of the webinar to two lucky random winners. And now I have the pleasure of introducing today's presenter. Debbie Diller is a national consultant and author and has been an early childhood elementary educator for over 40 years. Debbie uses her experience as a classroom teacher, Title I reading specialist, and literacy coach to teach others about sensible, realistic ways to meet the differentiated literacy needs of all students in the classroom. She is known for her groundbreaking work on independent learning, small group instruction, and classroom design, and has authored many books, videos, and an online course, which, can, which are widely used in classrooms and universities throughout North America. And now I have the pleasure of turning this over to Debbie Diller. Hi, everybody. It's great to be here and see so many people from all over the world. I really enjoyed looking at the chat and seeing um, lots of people from both coasts, um, friends from Australia, from Canada, Dominican Republic, um, just everywhere. So thank you for joining me. I'm sure a lot of you were in classrooms today, just like me. I am. Um, in a classroom right now in San Marcos, Texas, which is where I was working with teachers today. And you'll never guess what we were talking about. We were talking about small group instruction. And I was so excited because I got to use this new book, Simply Small Groups, that I'm gonna be talking about today. And I got to use it with a bunch of teachers um, and talking about the needs of the students in their classrooms. Um, especially um, this year in 2021. So I want to uh, you take this time to look at just four things. We only have a short amount of time together. And so I wanted to let you know, as a good teacher, what we're going to be talking, talking about tonight, letting you know our objectives first. So we're going to start by looking at purposes for small group instruction. Whenever I work with anything uh, instructionally or even in life, I always start with the why. The why is going to be the thing that on a rough day is going to help me get through. So if you ever have one of those crazy busy days where it's like, I just am not going to get everything done today, make sure that you make time for small group because it is such an important part of the day. So we're going to start with the why. I also want to share with you some ideas on organizing for small group instruction. One of the hallmarks of my work is organization, having everything at your fingertips. Um, the better organized you are and the more tools you have at your fingertips, the better off we're going to be in accomplishing what we want to with our students. We're also going to look briefly at how to form and plan for small group instruction, but not just how to do small groups. I want to be thinking about accelerating students' learning. In my work with small group over the, this is my 45th year of being an educator over the past four decades, I have been thinking a lot about small groups. There have been times where we did small groups, times where we didn't. Um, I'm glad small group is here in vogue and I think it's here to stay, especially in trying to think about how to meet the differentiated needs of so many different levels in our classrooms today. We have kids in many, many places. So we'll look a little bit about accelerating kids' learning. I'm going to give you some tips along the way. And then finally, I'm going to share some examples of small group and things we can do at a variety of developmental stages. Now, when I wrote this new book on small groups, I decided to try to simplify small group. And what I learned is there are a lot of pieces, so it's not really very simple, but I tried to simplify it as much as possible. So to do that, I used what I know about reading groups and um, developmental reading levels, and I broke things down into four big categories, which we'll be looking at today. Emergent readers, early readers, transitional readers, and fluent readers. So more on that to come. So that's what we'll be doing in our short time that we have together. As I said, I want to start with why is small group reading instruction important? So I'm going to invite you to take a minute in the chat to just type in, why do you think small group reading instruction is important? Why would you carve out time to even do small groups? And I'm going to monitor this as I'm sure it's going to come in pretty quickly. So I'm going to um, 
look at this um, and share a few to reach all the students in the classroom, making sure that it's differentiated to meet the needs of our students, work with all the varying levels in our classroom, help children with their needs, make sure they're not falling through the cracks, make sure that we are having a chance to work with some kids even one-on-one, -on -one, individualizing, to have equity and value our, value our curriculum, have quality instruction, less intimidating to students, can meet specific needs, support, oh, support what some of the kids didn't get in whole group, help them in small group as well. Oh, I'm so glad, Erin, that you wrote this one, build confidence. Um, one of the things that I want to make sure is happening that in small group is that our kids feel successful. And um, it's also a time to develop relationships with our kids, to, um, to develop relationships with us personally with the children as well as them with each other. Um, thank you for saying, I don't know who just wrote this, it went on and off my screen really quickly, um, efficiency of time as well. So um, sometimes we can just really make sure that we are um, um, getting to spend that quality time with children in a smaller number of students as well. So when I think about why have small, why have small group, I want to make sure that these things are really kept in the back of our minds. I'm going to show you some pages throughout our session today that are from the Simply Small Groups book. This is a, um, a screenshot that I, that I made where I could share with you just one little excerpt. Um, I'm not going to read a whole lot from the book to you, but I think this is a really important synopsis of why we have small group. Small group is a time to work closely with students, a time to get to know them. That to me is one of the huge benefits of small group time is to really get to know the kids because in a whole group setting, um, especially today, I think children really want to be known and heard. I also want to build on their strengths and interests. So I'm going to be talking this evening about having a, an, or morning for some of you in Australia, um, but I, I want to talk about building on strengths and interests and that starts with thinking about what kids can do. When I'm in small group, it's going to be a time to listen, learn, and develop relationships. So one of my big purposes for small group instruction is relationships. I want to make sure that we have a safe, trusting classroom environment. And it doesn't matter what your um, situation is, if you have um, in person, online, combinations of the two. I know those are still going on around the world. So making sure we have that safe, trusting classroom environment. I also want to make sure that we're working with students where they are along a continuum and helping them to grow. That's why I'm going to show you this developmental um, stance of looking at are kids emergent? Are they early readers? Are they transitional readers? Or are they in a fluent stage right now? And I think it's extremely important to think about this next statement. Instead of having each small group work on the same thing you've taught in whole group today according to your district scope and sequence, Use small group time to differentiate, provide instruction that matches your students and will help them accelerate. So I've gone into classrooms sometimes where teachers were teaching, um, uh, let's say that they were working with um, uh, long A patterns. And because they were working with long A vowel patterns in whole group, they decided to put that into their small group lesson as well. It's good thinking, but the problem is that some kids aren't really at that level where they can apply the long A the long A vowel combinations. So some students may need something different than what we taught in whole group. So I want to make sure that in small group, I'm really looking at where kids are and not trying to just make it match what I've done in whole group. Another quote from that page I wanted to just pull out separately is when planning small group time, think less about standards and more about what students and what they can do. Build from where your kids are. Now, what I'm saying in this quote is not that we should ignore the standards. Um, I am using my standards to help to guide all the instruction that I'm doing, uh, whether I'm working in whole group or small group. But in small group, I just don't want to think about what standard am I teaching today. I want to think about who are my students and what do they need? What can they do? And building upon that. So I think it's a really important point to make. I also wanted to share that throughout the book, I included EL tips as well as online teaching tips. And so here's an example of an EL tip. Thinking about our model, 
our multilingual students. Today, I was working um, in Texas with classrooms that have dual language programs. And so thinking about small group instruction is a place for EL, um, our, our EL students where they can develop that social language, that academic language, and they can feel supported. And I think it's very, very important to think about how they're not just learning content, um, and they're not just learning language, they're learning both of, the, both of those. So the more that we can be positive and really have kids feel successful is going to be a big part of what I want to do in that small group time. So I want you to think about success, success for students, and that will give success for you as the teacher as well. Now, as I'm, as I'm presenting, I really like to look at the chat to see what, um, what people, you know, are saying in response. So I did ask for Tori, who's my editor, if there's anything in particular that comes up in the chat, because um, it's going to be hard for me to monitor that at the same time that she'll share that, or if there is a question that I'm ha happy to um, to be able to um, look at that. So I love what Julie just said, Maslow before Blooms. Absolutely. It's a great way to summarize that. After I thought about how important it is to do small group, and I always want to keep that in the back of the mind, so I, my mind, so I don't cancel small group on, you know, like when I have a, a busy day. Um, another thing I said is to think about that organization. So I wanted to share just briefly about how do I set up a small group teaching area. When I work in classrooms, I found it's very important to think about the physical space of our classroom and um, where we have things located. I want to go into a classroom and see clearly that there is a small group teaching area that we have thought about it. Um, I'm not a big fan of pulling kids to the floor for small group for a couple of reasons. Um, not that I can't get up, because I can, <laughs> but I, I like to have a small group teaching area because I think it kind of communicates um, to visitors in the class, visitors that come to our rooms, and I know we have a lot of those these days. So I would like to um, communicate to other people that small group is Im so important that I've actually created a space here in my classroom for it. I also feel that um, when the children are sitting at a table, it's easier for them to write. It's easier for them to manage their books. Um, I'm going to show you how I choose a focus for my lesson, and I have a little board I use, so I like to put that there. And I know this sounds bizarre, but I also found that when you are um, when you're teaching in small group, if you're on the floor, sometimes it's easier for them to come to you and interrupt you. So I know that's kind of bizarre, but it is one of those things I've thought about. So when I look at setting up a small group teaching area, I wanted to share with you a few photos that are in the book that um, I think are really representative of um, good spaces. These were set up early in the school year. If you'll look at the picture at the top, you're going to see that this small group area was set up in a spot near a um, dry erase board or near a wall for display. So when I'm teaching in small groups, I will sometimes use anchor charts that I want to refer to during my lessons in small group. These are typically anchor charts that I've taught within whole group. And what I want to do is have them right there, um, again, at my fingertips so I can just make quick reference to those. Also, when I'm setting up a small group teaching area, it's very important to make sure that you have either some portable shelving, like you'll see in the top picture, or a cabinet that's nearby, which you'll see in the bottom picture, the bottom right corner, um, because that way you can put all the materials you need, your small group books and all the things that you're going to need for your lessons right there so you can grab them easily. I think the most important thing about setting up a small group teaching area is to make sure that wherever you locate it, you can see every inch of space in your classroom so you can see what the rest of the class is doing. Make sure that it's not too close and crowded to your whole group area so you're on top of things, but um, sometimes I've worked with teachers where they've actually even changed the space to make sure that they can monitor and that they have things in a position where they can get what they need. You will see on the bottom picture that there is a table anchoring this small group space. Now, this is from a lower grade classroom. The one on top is an upper grade room. The one on the bottom is a lower grade room. Very similar um, things that we're putting together. In the picture on the bottom, I love the way this teacher has materials for individual children organized. She's got magnetic letters um, on a cookie sheet, 
and there's a dry erase board there that the students can be using along with a little container that has dry erase materials in it. So everything is right there and she's not going to waste a second in her small group lesson. She's not going to miss a beat. You can also see in the bottom picture that there is a an alphabet chart hanging up when you're working with our um, kids, especially at early and emergent excuse me, emergent and early stages, to make sure you have an alphabet chart with photos, with sound pictures that you can refer to easily in your lessons. And it's great if that can be something that's going to match what you've been teaching in whole groups so that our children are familiar with that and that's easy for them to, um, to do. I see here that somebody has posted, we have lost our small group table so the kids can be distanced. Um, and I, you know, I'm really sorry that that's happened. They will be coming back. I, I would say that um, most schools that I'm working with feel um, that um, they're getting to return a little bit more to some kind of normalcy as far as classroom setup goes. And I'm so glad, April, that you wrote that um, you love to see that this is set up very much like the one in the top picture. Um, that you feel good right now. I want you to have some confirmation this evening too that as you see photos or as you hear me talking about things and it's like, that's something I'm already doing. Um, I wanna thank you guys for being teachers and for hanging in there because I know that it's really tough right now. Um, I, I know that we have a lot that we're working with. So, um, so make sure that you have that space and that you go back and think about that. Uh, maybe when you go back to your classroom tomorrow, take a look at that small group space. Um, with uh, small groups? Yes. Sorry, it's Tori. Can I interrupt a second? Uh, there are two other questions here about social distancing, and I wonder if you want to address them now or if you want to wait till the end. Right um, right one question. The first one is, how does it work with social distancing? And then there's a second question asking, how do you manage this for online learners and no document camera? I know those are things that you've encountered. <laughs> okay, okay, I'm a little rusty because I haven't I haven't been working in those classrooms this year. Um, I know, and there are pictures in the book to help too. So, um, and I'm sorry that I don't have slides of that in here right now. Um, in during COVID, a lot of the schools that I worked in, and, and some of the photos in my book, used those plastic, those like plexiglass. Um, little divider things and they they put those up on the small group table so that they had some kind of a barrier so i'm sorry i can't just pull that up and show you quickly um, i see somebody else has that they had written that those clear um, shields were used and so if you have those that from last year get those babies out and use those again um, i think that's definitely one of the biggest things i saw last year um, as far as the online thing with no document camera Boy, um, <laughs> with no document camera, that's a that's a tough one. I don't know. Does anybody else have there? Anybody else have anything like something you used instead? I'm looking. I'm monitoring the chat right now too. If anybody else has, what I did, I didn't own a document camera. I purchased one myself. Um, and so if you, I found an inexpensive one on. Um, uh, yeah, the i oh yeah, the iPhone and the iPad. Okay, okay, it's coming back to me. All right, how many of you seen that hack with the um, with the soup cans? Um, and you you can use your iPhone um, like a document camera. Um, I'm sorry, it's just I haven't been doing this here, so it, it's it's coming back to me right now. So um, so those are some things to think about, and some people are putting things in the chat too. Thank you very much. So I hope that's going to answer those questions that you had. Those are those are good ones. Um, and there are some online kinds of subscriptions you can use as well if you don't have that. So thank you guys. You're awesome. Thanks for being here. So I'm not just having to be the one answering this. I'm kind of pausing for a minute while you have a chance to answer that. All right. And thank you. If you do have questions, Tori, thank you so much for interrupting me. Not interrupting, but jumping in and doing that. You weren't interrupting. So I asked you to do that. So, okay. Zoom, Kahoot. Microsoft Sway. I'm learning some things here too. Some of these I'm, I'm not familiar with. So, all right, that should cover that. So that is just a little bit on thinking about the space. Um, yes, and I have used a whiteboard behind myself too. I had a, I had one set up in my office actually, which I'm in school right now. I'm not at home. All right, so I'm going to move into our next little section on the question that I have is, how do I organize for small group teaching? So I thought this evening what I would do is just pull out a couple of quick tips for you on organizing for small group. One of the first questions that I get, and I got this question again today from the teachers I work with, was 
How often should I meet with each group? How many groups should I have? How often should I meet with them? So my recommendation is to meet with student, with every child in the classroom every week in some type of small group instruction. When I talk about small groups, I'm not just going to be talking about guided reading. I have some other ideas I'll be sharing shortly with you as well. Um, I don't think that it's important or not important. I don't think it's necessary to meet with every group every day. Um, I, I still work with teachers that are trying to see four groups every single day for reading. I think that's a lot of planning that um, it's difficult to find time for. And um, so sometimes we end up just doing what I call grab a group, where we just kind of grab a group that didn't get something. So I want you to be thoughtful in planning for your small groups. So unless you have another adult in the room um, during the time that you're working with small groups, I really don't think it's humanly possible to see every small group every day. Most teachers that I work with have about four or five small groups total that they've organized for. And you'll see on the screen, I have a picture of a friend of mine's um, schedule. <clears throat> and what this one has, he is seeing two groups a day. He is posting the days of the week here, the times that he's meeting the groups. He uses color to organize his small groups. And then beside it, this is on his dry erase board, beside it he has the small groups and, be, and he has listed the students that are in that group currently. Um, this was actually from last year, so he had some kids online as well. And this was not his entire class, but you can see um, he has groups with varying numbers of students in them. I have found that when you're working in small group, um, trying to see three groups, three small groups in a row, sometimes what happens is the rest of the class kind of melts down by that third rotation. So I recommend that you might work with two small groups in a row back to back and then schedule a kind of a whole group brain break or a whole group kind of thing to do. And then if you want to meet it with a third literacy group, do that again after that short break, especially if you work with younger students. Um, what I have the rest of the class do is working at literacy stations, and I do have a whole series called Simply Stations about that thing. That's not what we're talking about tonight, but if you're thinking about how this works time-wise, I hope that this little graphic will give you one idea of looking at that. I often am also asked um, how many, how long should these groups last? I have found a sweet spot for kindergarten seems to be about 15 minutes a group rather than 30 minutes. I think 30 minutes for a small group lesson for kindergarten is way too long, especially for the children that are out there working independently of you. Um, it's just, it's a lot. I learned this by working with kindergartners, and I remember one day when I was working with a group of students, and I had these little five-year-olds at my table, and about 14 minutes into the lesson, one of the kids just stood up at the table and said, I'm done now, and walked away. So our children will show us, you know, this is about how much how much I can do. In first and second grade, I typically work with students for about 20 minutes per group. In grades three and up, um, it might be 20 to 25 minutes a group. Again, these are just some um, just some some parameters, some some thoughts. I also posted on this slide. I have a picture of an online schedule um, from a school that I worked with last year. And uh, this is how they shared the schedule as far as small groups. And they communicated to the parents what time their students would be working in small group so that they would know um, ahead of time. So, okay. So I hope that that, yeah. And um, somebody just wrote in here that you can get a lot done in 15 minutes if you have a plan. And that is the bottom line, is that um, we want to make sure that you have a really good plan um, and um, the planning and having that lesson plan in front of you is going to be really, really critical. So thanks. And I'm kind of looking at the chat so I can feel like I have somebody to talk to. <laughs> so thank you guys for what you're commenting on as we go here. All right. <clears throat> when I think about how many students should be in each group, my recommendation is typically three to five students in each group. I really think it's important to group our, uh, have our groups be formed around needs, not just numbers. I was working in a classroom recently with a, a relatively new teacher. She had 20 students in her classroom. And I said, tell me about your groups and how you've, been, how you've organized them. And she said, it's perfect. I have 20 students, so I have four groups with five kids in each. And I said, how did you come up with that? And she said, well, it just kind of made sense number-wise. 
And so I told her, instead of looking at numbers, think about needs. And you may have you may have um, five children or four or five children that need something similar, but it might be five kids might be too big for that group. So my recommendation is always to make the group small enough so nobody can hide, especially if you're working with children that are having some difficulty in learning new concepts. Um, sometimes it's it's better to make that group smaller rather than larger so that the children have a chance to participate and become a lot more successful during that time. So I wanted to share a little bit on that organizing with thinking about um, how big the group should be, how long they last, and how many students you're going to be working with at a time. Um, in in my book, I also have all kinds of questions and answers in, in the first section, just kind of like station, uh, the small group basics that you um, that you might want to be um, thinking about. So, um, and class sizes that I'm seeing right now, and every I'm seeing everything from some classrooms with 15 kids to other classrooms with 25 students in them, depending on where I am. Um, and so, um, uh, yes, somebody just mentioned. Um, that the Simply Stations book. Tori, can you help me with that when it went really fast? Sure. Um, Amber's asking, you mentioned your book, Simply Stations. I see several that you wrote. Which ones would you recommend on supporting teachers and developing their centers? Maybe we should talk about that at the end. Okay, that sounds like a perfect one. So don't forget to come back to that. Yeah, so, yeah. Amber, will will check in on that at the end. That sounds good, because I don't want to get distracted, because then I'll start talking about that book. So that wouldn't be right. good. <laughs> but um, yeah, so, and I thank you for those of you that are posting a little bit about, um, you know, your numbers of students. So um, I, I really think that like, even five kids in some cases is, is a lot to have in a group, but if you've got 30 kids, um, you got to do what you got to do. So, um, you know, that's that's just reality. And every every year is a new year and uh, we do the best we can with with what we have right now. I'm glad kids are coming to school. I'm glad that I'm glad you have have kids in your classrooms. Now, when we think about organizing for instruction, I want to give you some kind of step by step processes I go through when I'm thinking about what to do in small groups. So step one is I'm going to always start with assessment. When I look at assessment, um, I, I think about, oh, there was a quote I have here that I <laughs> somehow got cut off. I put it in white and it got lost. Um, and the quote that I had on here that you can't see says, follow the lead of the child. I think it's so important to get to know our students and we have a, I don't know about you, but most places I go, you know, we're assessing kids to death. We have so many, so much data we're collecting that we're focusing sometimes more on the data collection than we are on what to do with the data. So, um, and sometimes the data is duplicated. So what I want you to think about when you look at your data is really, what am I learning about my students by, by this data that I'm collecting? A lot of our data is being collected online, which I understand it's an expedient way to do it. Um, a lot of our programs will organize groups even for us. But I also want you to think about listening to your students, um, reading with them, finding out what they're interested in, and finding out what they can do. That is not something that technology is going to necessarily tell us. So I want you to use a combination of technology and actually listening to a kid read when you're thinking about who's going to be in which group. When you look at um, what the kids already brought to us and you look at what they can do, um, then along with that, I want you to look at their reading development and their language development, which I'm going to share with you in a few minutes, um, so that we can plan for instruction that's really going to help our kids grow, that's going to help them to accelerate. I was working with a group of teachers today that are interventionists, and one of the teachers was sharing with me that she has some kids she's been working with in small group and they're just not moving. She's meeting with small groups, but the kids are kind of stuck. I'm sure some of you can probably um, say amen to that when you're having something similar happen. Um, just meeting in small group is not magical. <laughs> it's not just because you're in small group, kids are gonna suddenly, you know, like fly. So we were talking about something that she was doing that was related to oral language development. These were some pre, um, uh, pre-emergent readers that were um, like at pre-level A or double A, there's sometimes that's the level that's identified. Um, but we started talking about what they were doing with oral language. What she realized is that what they were talking about was stuff that they may not have had much experience with as students, as children. So we talked about bringing in some objects that they could use for an oral language group 
with kids at this um, pre-emergent level or very, very early emergent level and have them talk about something they know. So for example, I said, bring in a Hot Wheel. If you have one of those little cars and you start talking about that and this, the teacher was like, oh my God, that's what's missing. I'm doing the activities, but I don't have things that are things that my kids can really relate to. So getting to know your students is going to be really important. So I hope you'll look at that data as your starting point, both your online data that you're collecting as well as actually listening to, um, to your students read. So this is the one of the, if you um, came on here beforehand, um, not be, if you came on to the session, but if you got some of the email um, telling you about this session tonight, we uh, shared with you some of the pages from the online companion that I wrote to go with the book. And this is one of the charts that I created. There's a lot of charts um, in, this re in these resources. And this one is how to determine the child's developmental reading stage. So I told you I have like basically four different stages that I have thought through um, when I'm thinking about teaching in small groups that I've included in this book. The emergent reader stage, um, what the reason I created this chart is though, if you don't have a tool to use um, that's going to give you an actual reading level for your students, you could look at this to get an idea of like where to start. So our emergent students, um, if you're familiar with the Fountas and Pinnell reading levels, and I'm just going to use that as one marker because it's something a lot of people around the country or actually around the world have used, I have included pre-level A through level C with emergent reader stage. This is actually not on your screen right now. It's on another, um, it's another part of this chart. I was only able to put one piece up to show you because um, like the, the second part of it. Early reader stage, I have students reading at um, the, um, the reading levels from D through um, I. And then transitional readers, I have J through M and fluent, I have N and up. So if you are using, I'm, I'm trying, I try to create something that you could use with what you already have. So if you are using any leveled books at all, you can use them along with the resources that I included here. If you don't have leveled books, that's okay too. You don't need them to make this work, but I wanted to have something for everybody. So when you look at, um, for example, um, today we were talking about students needing um, to decode multi-syllable words. So I look at the transitional reader stage and one of the things that kids are learning to do at that transitional reader stage is decoding longer multi-syllable words using syllable types. That is not something that I want to do with emerging kids or early readers. That's something that's really going to happen in that stage. So. I'm going to try to determine my reading stage so that I know where to go and where to focus my instruction. Focus is going to be a really important word for you to walk away with this evening. Step three, I'm going to form my small groups. One easy way to do this is just to use a file folder for your classroom. And if you have some teachers I'm working with teach um, a morning class and then they have an afternoon class. So in that case, they'd have two folders. And it's not because the kids are only coming to school half a day, although that's certainly happening in some places too, probably. Um, but what we've done is in this case, this is one teacher's classroom or one of her classes that she has. She wrote every child's name on a small um, like a, I took sticky notes and kind of just cut them up into smaller little pieces. So she wrote every child's name on one of those little sticky tabs. And then she sorted them into groups based upon the developmental rating stages. And she was able to use this chart that we had just looked at a minute ago. Um, and there's a little, like I said, this is just part of it. But she was able to use this to help her think about these different groups and who to have work with other students so that she's working on something similar with them. After she did that, then she added another little sticky note that said if the students were emergent readers, if she has two groups of early readers, you can see she didn't try to put um, six or seven kids in a group, and even five was a little bit big here. And then she has several students that are transitional readers. So this is how she began thinking about forming her small groups, using her data, and then moving forward from there. The next step, step four, was to decide what kind of small group to use. When I was writing, about small group instruction, I decided to 
not just use guided reading groups, which I have used for many, many years myself and I'm very familiar with, but I wanted to include other kinds of small group possibilities. So again, if you got the um, some of the online companion materials that were sent out ahead of time, um, I think there were maybe four or five different charts, this is one of them. And these are some of the types of small groups who will be in each um, why I'm going to meet with those small groups and what stages might be might this be best suited to. So for example, one type of small group is an oral language group. Typically I'm going to work with emergent readers or with newcomers to a language in those oral reading groups, um, oral language group. And there's really not going to be a lot of um, reading taking place here. There will be some print involved. There will be some books that we might be using. Um, I might have objects kids are talking about. And I do that for the purpose of trying to get kids to speak in longer, more complex sentences. Again, talking about just something that I did today when I was working with some teachers, um, they had some students that were at that pre-emergent stage, that very, very beginning stage, and they, they realized that they weren't doing much with oral language. They were focusing a, more, a lot more on letter work. And it's not that letters aren't important, but they realize that oral language needs to be a part of what they're doing with children at that level as well. I have, if we kind of like move through here, um, word study groups can be um, at any stage. You might have some groups that are working on some phonics, spelling, and vocabulary development um, that match where they are. For example, um, I might have, at the emergent level, I might be working with some children with their names right now. Um, some of that early print awareness, and that would be that word study piece. I might be working with some students on phonics patterns. I might be working with some fluent students on morphology and looking at word meanings and the origins of those. So depending on the level of the students I'm working with and, and what they can do, I may have different kinds of groups. I've also included options for small groups such as writing groups, book clubs, especially for transitional and fluent readers, and inquiry groups. Inquiry groups, a lot of times I'm going to be working with fluent readers, um, especially kids that you're having trouble. Um, I don't know if you have any any kids at like those fluent levels that can read but choose not to read that need some motivation. So inquiry groups can be a great thing. We'll look at that in a few minutes. Step five is after I have figured out who's in which group, what kind of group I'm going to work with them on, then I'm going to be planning and teaching in my small groups. I have included lesson planning templates, um, different ones, there are different lesson planning templates depending on the level that the kids are working on. Um, and when I say the level, I'm talking about those de developmental levels, emergent, early, transitional, or fluent. And I have included in here um, a warm up which is part of my before reading, and then also the during reading, and then a place to write some comprehension questions for after reading, and then a space too where I can do some reflection. So those, um, those templates are used throughout, um, throughout the work that I've done, and we have some blank ones that are online as well. Now when you're um, when you're working, I'm going to go back there for a second, when you're working with your students in small group, last year one of the things that we found at the end of the year, we found that we, um, when I was working with some, some teachers on basically pandemic teaching and the online piece and the hybrid piece and all the other things we were doing, I found that <clears throat> When we, when we connected reading and writing, our kids were making more progress. So my recommendation is that you choose a focus for the lesson, which we'll look at in a minute here. And once you choose that focus for your lesson, you, you stick with that focus for multiple lessons. So you don't change like what you're doing every single day. Like stick with that focus for multiple days until you see the kids are starting to get it. Um, also, <clears throat> I will work with it in reading for a day or two and then we'll work with that same focus in writing. That is the magic bullet that has helped to accelerate a lot of our students, is that reading and writing connection. So I want to um, make sure that that's a, a takeaway that, that you have to take that same focus, but we'll look at that here in a minute. So how do I plan and teach in small groups at different reading stages? Um, this idea of focus is one that I came upon probably about 20 years ago. 
I was teaching in small groups, but I found that sometimes kids weren't moving as fast as I would like them to. So I discovered that if I could um, think about having a focus for my lesson, I actually wrote on my lesson plan, focus. And I wrote down what it was that I wanted to see kids be able to do at the end of this lesson. So for example, this picture that I have up here, um, the focus is, this is emergent readers, and the focus is to pay attention to print and make sure that I am putting my finger underneath each word as I read. Now, if you're working with fluent readers, I'm not talking your language right now. This is really what we're doing with these emerging kids. As I said, I'm going to use that same focus for multiple lessons. We're going to read the text in one lesson, and then we'll write in the next lesson using that same focus. So these are students that are probably, um, this is probably level A or B that we're working with here, so this very, very beginning levels. The focus I have, um, I use a little dry erase board and I put it on a plate stand and I call that the focus board. Before the kids start reading, we go over the focus and I tell them, today this is what I want to make sure that you're doing as you read. And we're going to use the same focus as we write. You can see we, um, on another day, not the same day, we did, um, we reread the book that we had um, read the day before or the time we had met before. And then we worked with writing together and writing something with that same pattern and using those same high frequency words. We did a cut up sentence, which you can see was a tear up sentence because I didn't happen to have a scissors that day <laughs> when I was working in this classroom. And so the kids put that back together. That was the magic bullet. That's the piece that took the kids further. So I'm going to take a few minutes to look at um, in your in your small group lesson, what do, what do the students do and what is the teacher doing? So the um, and I'm sorry, this is covering up my screen. I'm trying to, I can't read what it says. <laughs> okay. All right. So this is the before reading. Um, this is another picture of a focus board. These focus boards are available as um, they're included in the book. There are templates for these. You can make your own as well. In this case, um, reading with expression is one that I'm using in the um, sometimes in the early reading stages, sometimes in the transitional reading stages. And basically what students are going to be doing um, in this lesson is I want them to read the focus board. That's why I have the little pictures on at emergent early levels. Um, the teacher is then going to model the focus reading behavior. So if we're going to read with expression, I'm going to show what that looks like and say this is what I want you to do as you're reading today. They may practice their phonics skills needed for reading this text also before we start to read. Now, not every kid is going to need a heavy dose of phonics in every lesson. There are some kids that I've encountered that can decode the books, they can decode the words, but they have no idea what they're reading. I am not going to throw an extra dose of fuel on the fire for that. But there are often um, students that get stuck at levels because of that phonics piece. So I'm going to include that um, before the kids start to read. I'm also going to have them preview the text and make predictions and set the purpose for reading. In the early stages, pretty much the emergent early levels, I'm going to work on modeling how to set my purpose for reading and thinking about what I want to read to find out, but I want kids to eventually do that a little bit more on, the, uh, on their own. The teacher also is going to introduce the text by telling just a little bit about what the book's about today to get the kids started with that. In my lesson, I'm going to include a before reading, a during reading, and an after reading segment for many of the kinds of groups I'm doing, especially if I'm working um, with kids reading and writing. In the during reading time, that's when I want kids to read the text as independently as possible. I don't have them take turns reading. I'm not having the students, um, I'm not having them <clears throat> um, necessarily even echo read like that I read it and then they read it next. I typically don't read the book to them and then have them read it. I want them to read it as independently as possible, which is why I've chosen books really carefully. Once I pick my focus, I pick a, t I pick a text to match that. My job as a teacher is to listen in to the readers and prompt as needed. I, um, I'm trying to get kids to read as, as independently as possible. I want them to be successful, so I'm going to be there as a scaffold and help. One of the big things I want them to do during reading is to try the focus reading behavior. 
So in my before reading, I told them today, I want you to read with expression. This is what it looks like. This is how it sounds. And then during reading, I'm going to make sure that I am referring to the board and listening in for that same reading behavior. That's how I'm going to help to accelerate kids. I want you to think about having a, a conversation with your students in that small group time and having a conversation before they read, talking about what they think is going to come next, you know, what the book's going to be about, having a conversation while they read, particularly talking with individual kids about what they've read so far, and then in the after reading, um, which we'll get to in a second, I want them to I want to continue having a conversation with the kids about what they've just read. If you have any students that have trouble with comprehension, um, comprehension is a big part of reading, and I want to make sure that kids are reading for meeting and they're not reading just to decode, so decoding is important as well as comprehending. So one way to get kids to do that is to have them interact with the text, for example, maybe using sticky notes to make sure that they're thinking about what they're reading. Now again, if I'm working with those emergent readers that are barely, you know, uh, they're barely writing letters and sounds. I'm not going to have them use sticky notes, but my kids here you'll see some students that are at um, the transitional stage of reading, no matter what the grade level is that they're working in. And they were working with some words that they reviewed, some high frequency words ahead of time. We made sure that those words were in the book, and then we might have them even sticky note when they come across one of those words. Um, or they might write it on the dry erase board just as a reminder. Sometimes we'll have them use sticky notes for comprehension. For example, if they're reading informational text, it might be a book about frogs. And I may say, I want you to think about, find three interesting things about frogs and, and where they live as you read this section. And then we'll share those. That helps kids really pay attention to what they're reading. Finally, in the after reading portion, that's where I want to make sure that the kids are having a discussion with others about that, what they read. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, they could talk to each other about what they've read when they finished. I'm going to also make sure that I have a small group discussion with them, and I want to make sure that I'm prompting that deeper thinking by asking some higher level questions, which I'm going to pre-plan. That's part of my lesson planning. After we've discussed what we've read, then I'm going to refer back to my focus board. You'll see this teacher has hers posted. She's working with a different focus than those other classes where she's working with text features and using those to find information. So I'm going to say today, let's go back to the one where we were reading with expression. I want you to find a place in the text today where you were reading with expression. And then I'm going to have the kids share that really briefly with the small group. It's almost like their exit ticket. And then I want them to reflect on their learning in small group by doing that. As a teacher, I'm going to remind students to keep doing that in every book that you read from now on. So what we did in our small group today, keep on trying that. That was a lot in a short amount of time, but in a nutshell, I wanted to share with you what I include in that small group lesson. All right, <clears throat> excuse me. It's late where I am and I'm losing my voice, so I'm going to try to keep on going. <clears throat> All right, I'm going to take the last few minutes of our time together to share just a few examples of, depending on the um, stage of reading, the developmental stage that we're in, what it is that we um, might have kids focus on. Excuse me one second, please. Sorry about that. So emergent readers, I told you we have these focus boards with visuals for emergent and early readers. Here's just one sample. So I may decide that I have a group of kids that really need some high frequency words. I have provided some um, differentiated high frequency word lists for you that you don't see right now, but those are part of, um, part of this new book. And that's my focus board. So I'm going to say to kids today as we're reading, we're going to pay attention to these words. And there might be a couple of new words we're going to work with. Throughout the book, I've included teaching tips, and so here are a few that go with high frequency words, if that was our focus, um, that at levels A and B, I want to be sure children are looking closely at high frequency words and use the sounds they know to read them quickly. I don't want kids to just like look at a, look at a word, like say the word is go. I don't want them to just look at go and always just like have them memorize what it looks like. I want them to also know that go has go that we put together. Now, I don't want them sounding that word out every time, but I want us to use, to use phonics to help kids figure out these high frequency words so that that will give them that clue of how to keep remembering it. 
I'm also at A and B going to work with high frequency words that have only two sounds to be to blend in the beginning. So like at levels A and B, words like up, at, in, it, am, on, and in. So which words we work with when are going to be very important to accelerate students. Once students know a few of these short vowel sounds and a few consonant sounds, then these two sound words will be easier for them to remember. Trust me, as a kindergarten teacher, I was trying to flash all these cards and have kids remember them and they just were not sticking. When I'm working in my small groups, Again, this is a page from the book to show you. I'm going to have children find those high frequency words in a familiar short text, um, have the name, the letters in the word, move their body to match tall letters, reach the sky, short letters. We actually physically act those words out sometimes. I'm going to give them magnetic letters to build that word at the emergency, emergency <laughs> at the emergent level. And then they're going to have that familiar, familiarity when they're working with this. Again, I've got like some EL tips and some um, tips for high frequency word work online that I've shared. I said that I believe reflection is a really important part of what we're doing, so I've included some reflection questions as well that are available. So if we were working with high frequency words, then I might have the kids show a new word that they learned to read or write in small group today. It's taking it full circle from starting with what we um, what we were focusing on. I'm going to use that in my before reading, my during reading, and my after reading. All right, quick look at early readers. Um, let's say that I had a focus of phonics and the vowel consonant E syllable. This is my little focus board that I'm starting with. You'll see it's very, very visual. Um, I always have the vowels in red to remind kids that vowels need to be part of every syllable. Here are a few teaching tips. I was just working with this today. Kids stuck at levels F and G. It's an epidemic. So things we need to focus on to move kids forward. Sometimes we, a lot of times we have to slow down to speed up. And so focusing on vowels, particularly at these levels, long vowel patterns, um, vowel plus R, and even vowel digraphs like the OO and the OU. To figure this out, I went into tons and tons of leveled books to figure out what were those patterns that were coming up the most frequently. So, um, so at F and G, those long vowel patterns, vowel plus R vowel digraphs are going to be your go-to. Now, those are also used at D and E, and they're continued on into H and I. So know that that's when you do your phonics piece, that's a really important one to, um, to kind of zoom into. And then helping kids use those syllables to decode long words. Here are some sample pictures from the book. Um, I do some work with them with dry erase boards, also with um, some of dry, dry erase materials where I have them write a word like cap, um, talk about the vowel, is it short or long, add that E, what happens next. I've got anchor chart samples to help you think about having kids connect to that. And then again, coming back to that throughout my lesson. With my early readers, one of the questions I might ask is what phonics patterns did you learn today? Tell the letters and sounds they make. All right, transitional readers. Sorry, I'm zipping through. I know I only have two minutes, maybe one. All right, transitional readers. Um, I've included reciprocal teaching cards for kids at the trans transitional level, but I've, I'm working with vocabulary. It's, this is clarifying. Um, then here are some of the vocabulary-focused teaching tips, making sure that we are introducing new vocabulary from the book that kids need if it's a word they need to really comprehend this text well. Um, modeling how to use dictionaries or glossaries. I have some pictures of kids keeping cool little notebooks where they, cut, they jot down their new words and then reminding the kids to use that new vocabulary as they discuss and summarize what they've read. I want to make sure that in these small group lessons when I'm focusing on vocabulary that the children are using those new words in their talking about the book, in their answering comprehension, comprehension questions orally, and also in the writing that they do. So there's lots and lots of tools in here to get you into those specific things, including multiple meaning words, homophones, and idioms. When I'm working with students in small group, I'm often going to um, give them highlighter type um, or little tiny sticky notes where little tiny pieces where they can um, this here they're um, to either highlight the new words or here they're doing a synonym swap where they're covering up a word with a very small little post-it um, to show another word that could represent that same word. That's a great way to check in to see 
if um, if students are understanding what those vocabulary mean, words mean. Again, ending re in reflection and thinking about what was your focus in small group today and how did that help you as a reader or as a writer. Finally, fluent readers. Um, with fluent readers, I mentioned earlier one type of group I might work with is an inquiry group. They may not, I wouldn't meet with an inquiry group every single day. This is different than a guided reading group. Um, they may be doing some partner research or even independent research in preparation for their meetings. I would have these be teacher-led meetings to start, but then release to kids over time. And who needs these kind of groups? Um, kids with passionate interests, kids who need to be motivated, especially kids that you're trying to get into some informational text. So the, um, <clears throat> the kinds of um, things that we're going to, sorry, this is covered up right now. <laughs> can't read it. Um, sorry, I can't read what that says. Tori, can you help me? What does this say right here? <laughs> the third column or fourth column. Um, types of text to use. No, the one to the Oh, left. I'm sorry. Benefits of this type of group. I'm sorry. I couldn't read it. <laughs> Counting's not my thing. Okay. Uh, benefits of this type of group. So I want you to think again about that why and then the types of groups that you'll be using. So there's here's where I'll pull in that short text like um, interviews of expert articles to read, um, informational texts around topics of interest. Now, when I'm working in those small groups, I've given you kind of step-by-step -step how an inquiry group works so that you can think about step-by-step um, -step what you're going to do and then the teacher's role there. I also have some anchor charts on things like how to take notes so that um, you can um, have those to use as reference. Again, you'll see a big emphasis on focus. So this is one of our um, reflection tools that goes with us to think about how we did in that small group and we were working in that inquiry group. Okay. Finally, I'm going to end with teacher reflection. I have included some tools to think about teacher reflection, even thinking about it's how's it working not well or it's amazing. I've included things like this for you to use personally as a teacher as well as something that you might even use as a PLC. So I hope that you will um, use some of these tools um, too and I'm sure there's some questions that are going around with this. So all right I'm going to go to my last slide. I'm sorry. <laughs> questions which we're probably out of time for. So I'm going to let you take it ever Margaret. Actually um, Debbie if you could advance one more slide. Oh I'm sorry. Okay. Yep. Oops, that one oh. didn't load. Oh, okay. It was the cover of the book. So if you could oh. go back to the question slide and just hold up the okay. book that you have with you. But um, that was a lot of useful information in our short hour with Debbie. So thank you so much, Debbie, for all of that. And we will, um, if you do have a specific question, you can email uh, Tori Bachman at Tori dot bachman at corwin.com and we will answer as many as possible.